Our conversations continue here at Davos 2023. Joining me on the program now is Rajesh Gopinathan of TCS. Rajesh, always a pleasure. Many thanks for joining us. Well, the world hasn't changed since you announced your numbers, fortunately. But, you know, just in terms of a mood check, my reading of the conversations that I've been having here is that it's not as pessimistic as one thought it would be coming into the event. Is that your sense as well? First of all, Shireen, uh, <clears throat> pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us here. And uh, as you said, uh, the mood is definitely much more optimistic. Uh, in fact, uh, when we came out with our numbers, I had said that our individual conversations with uh, customers were a lot more positive than what the overall macro commentary was and that we're basing it on that. That uh, confidence has got strengthened with the discussions that we are having here. One on one, everybody is positive. I would say incrementally what has changed is that the European uh, side, there also the confidence has increased. I don't think that uh, it, the decision making will You had red flagged it as the big challenge. I would said that uh, that is the one where uh, you know we are not sure about how it will progress. But uh, multiple threats that are emerging here, uh, the opening up of China uh, is a big thing both from a humanitarian perspective, assuming that uh, you know, they are able to manage that whole opening up well, and then the economic perspective, that, uh, that opens up an export market for the European companies. So that's coming out very strongly as a big, uh, big thing. Second is, of course, what you've seen around Davos, it's warm Davos. So yeah. The flip side is that the energy crisis was not as severe, and uh, that's also playing into a lot of people's uh, you know, perspective in terms of how the year is likely to be. What is the role that TCS can play uh, as far as this innovation story is concerned? How are you positioning yourself for that? Shireen, we are the bearers of the flame. Right at a time that nobody was talking about it, we really doubled down on the innovation agenda, uh, significantly upped our investment into research and more importantly innovation. And uh, that shows through in the numbers. So if you look at uh, patents, uh, the sheer patent filing that we have uh, far outstrips anything else that happens in the corporate sector in India, captive or non-captive. Uh, today, uh, we have got more than 2,600 granted patents, another 6,000, 7,000 in the pipeline, and we're getting more than one patent granted a day, a calendar day. So it's kind of really uh, ramping up. And, uh, and which kind of areas would these be mostly? It's actually a crossover. About 70, 80% of them are on technology and applied uh, technology, but 20-30% uh, are on areas like materials, uh, areas like uh, you know new construction, uh, healthcare is a big uh, component of what is uh, going on. Uh, we have in fact uh, you know uh, something in terms of being able to actually take a saliva swab mm. and uh, be able to predict uh, preterm delivery and as a ability to look at that. Similarly, we have done work on genomics, where uh, when you do your viral testing, uh, it only tells you whether there is a viral load or not. It doesn't tell you whether it is on the up cycle or on the down cycle. By combining data science with uh, what's happening on the vital side, we're able to actually model saying that, did you have an infection which is on its way down right. or are you at an early stage of uh, infection? So there are various uh, areas, a uh, lot technology leveraged, but some are in the pure sciences domain and applied sciences uh, domain. And that gives us a lot of, uh, you know. So what's going to be the next leg of the kind of innovation that you hope to drive? And the I next leg of about, investments as well? It's about uh, applied innovation and the ability to actually uh, engage in the innovation value chain of an uh, organization. Uh, we do a lot of work in uh, areas like uh, refineries. Uh, materials is a big um, portion of what we are uh, doing. Healthcare is a big uh, portion. Even cosmetics. Uh, we have done uh, investments in building what we call uh, digital skin, which kind of simulates how uh, you know, uh, transport happens through the uh, skin layer. So the ability to take something and then to be able to integrate that into the larger value chain of the of a commercial organization that's where the uh, where the excitement lies of course you moved people to work from home uh, there is a pull back on that and that's happening globally as well and within india uh, what do you believe is going to be the mix going forward are you now moving everybody back or how is it going to work in the future uh, so we are went out into the remote working in a very extreme uh, situation. Uh, we do believe that hybrid is the way and long term that hybrid, whether it is 50-50, 75-25, 25-75, we need to wait and see. But it is important that it is hybrid within commutable distance. It is not completely uh, remote because the organizations connect with the individual both 
uh, digitally as well as uh, you know an, an, as an organization context of people coming together is a very critical part so right now we are trying to get back to the mean uh, the first focus is uh, three days uh, in uh, office for a majority of our people but we are pushing for uh, much more return to office and we think that's very critical also uh, in the context of what happened in terms of the growth because we added more than 100000 people over the uh, pandemic 125 130000 people uh, that's a large uh, chunk even by our uh, standards so we need to integrate this uh, workforce back and uh, make sure that uh, they are fully integrated with the both culture ethos as well as the operating uh, models of the company so during the course of this year you are going to see systematically uh, us pushing for greater uh, work from office and towards the later half of the year probably we will start putting in more systematic ways of uh, looking at hybrid uh, work uh, our project management systems need to change for that there are many other operational things that we need to do which we will be doing executing towards the uh, later half of this year and next year it's been what Five years now uh, in in the CEO seat. Uh, so, uh, what what has for you been the most exciting aspect of it, as well as the most challenging aspect of it? Yeah, it's six years actually, six years, unbelievable. Yes. But uh, it's flown by, and uh, that's one of the things that uh, you don't really have as much time as you think, and time goes faster than you thought. Uh, it's been kind of broken into the you know the transition, and then. Uh, one or two years and then the pandemic and then the post pandemic uh, but the most important thing is that uh, the organization uh, is critical uh, so you need to understand the organization that has a longevity much more than uh, you know uh, anything else and you got to make sure that uh, you play it uh, you know day by day uh, play it a ball at a time uh, not losing sight of the vision the good thing is that even with the pandemic our long term vision our long term journey has remained intact so that has stood the test of the uh, pandemic and that's very encouraging operationally tactically we got to keep on rolling with the punches as it were and uh, lots of punches <laughs> i anticipated <laughs> at least given how volatile things are at this point in time or is it now you know you have you built in resilience to deal with it actually yeah, i mean so see leave aside whether the demand will be a few percentage points up or uh, down i think what we have gone through over the last couple of uh, years and what you see in the immediate uh, future uh, of course uh, there is nothing that uh, there is very surprisingly out there but it's in the nature of uh, things that it will blind side you so we got to be but a lot of confidence in the resilience of the organization uh, in the ability to deal with it so quite quite confident about uh, where it is i don't think uh, it can be other than whether the demand is slightly up or down uh, nothing else that really bothers if there is one priority uh, you know in terms of outside of the daily bread and butter stuff that you are doing that you really want to focus on uh, to ensure that you fortify the future of the organization you talked about of course innovation as being one of those drivers uh, what would it be it goes back to innovation but at a more broader theme Uh, it is about uh, you know making sure that we articulate the knowledge that we have and we actually build a business model that monetizes the knowledge so we have built a very resilient business model that monetizes our effort uh, we have not and embedded inside that effort was the knowledge now what we are trying to do is to actually externalize that uh, knowledge and make it more visible and to package it and to try and monetize it higher i think there is a lot of value capture opportunity uh, that lies ahead and uh, we owe it to ourselves we owe it to our own teams because we have been moving mountains uh, but probably getting credited for the effort rather than the intellect behind what we have done so focusing on that uh, how do you how do you change that perception and it's it's a hard thing to do but how do you change the perception uh, you know that people have it's uh, it starts first with yourself always so we have this uh, what we call our triple a strategy awareness articulation amplification the first step is awareness that uh, your own self awareness of what you do of what you know so we have been uh, we have had a uh, systematically building that out uh, we call this contextual masters uh, we celebrate knowledge internally so we are actually trying to you know make people aware of the knowledge that they possess of the value of that uh, knowledge in context and uh, systematically helping them articulate that because that's also 
you know a key uh, skill so once you start first is awareness and then once you start articulating it then you can start amplifying it and then converting it into monetization so we're taking it step at a time i don't think we are anywhere near monetization yet but we are well on the way of awareness uh, today if you look at you know tcs uh, the rank and file of tcs is very well uh, you know attuned to this idea of contextual knowledge and uh, we now have more than 50000 people whom we have certified as contextual experts and we have programs running to bolster that uh, knowledge so it's an inside out uh, transformation i think rather than you know worry about whether others are acknowledging it first is you believe in it and you demonstrate it uh, the acknowledgement from outside will automatically come i believe well let me end by asking you about something that a lot of people here are talking about and that is chat gpt and uh, whether this actually legitimizes ai what do you make of it well that's a tough question uh, chat gpt is evolving we need to uh, you know understand it in essence uh, does it legitimize ai i don't know what it does is it uh, tells that ai is not to be trivialized and it is not some geeky thing but it will affect our lives a uh, lot sooner than what probably people thought 6 months ago uh, so we need to be prepared to accept that and integrate that into who we, what we do and who we are mm. so if you take it from a tcs perspective mm. we need to think of it as a tool and uh, we need to make sure that it is integrated into service delivery and our service delivery morphs to be able to accept that internally uh, we have done the same thing when it came to automation but we need to do this again so that we ai is you know out of the denial mode now it is uh, there with us legitimizing is a different uh, uh, thing that we'll have to wait and see what the implications of it is because it sits on the kind of it has the potential to sit on the sum total of human knowledge yes and uh, that brings up interesting questions on uh, you know uh, what would that be so if yeah. it comes through from chat gpt versus if it is uh, processed by humans um after a few years because chat gpt can do it a lot faster uh, what does it do to the human process knowledge versus the uh, chat gpt process knowledge uh, not chat gpt generative ai sure, process sure. knowledge yeah. so it brings up interesting questions on you know who owns that knowledge yeah uh, it's very interesting that it's kind of a uh, you know cycle <coughs> coming back full circle uh, if you look at oriental societies mm. india and all uh, we are always believe that knowledge is a collective asset and uh, you know you could possibly see uh, generative ai pushing us back to that common realization that knowledge is a collective asset and not to be uh, owned by an individual entity or an organization well that's an interesting thought and uh, uh, and something to to think about and ponder over but rajesh it's been an absolute pleasure thank you very much for joining us here in davos uh, and uh, making time for us to talk to us about what clients are saying but more importantly where tcs is headed appreciate you joining us here today we will take a break there's a lot more coming up don't go anywhere we're back in a minute with a lot more on cnbc tv at